everybody who listened to the experience last week, um, I talked about the upcoming Midnight Express 35th anniversary reunions that we're doing in a few places and the fact that Dennis Connery is going to be a part of it. And uh, the reason why that the health issues that have prevented Dennis from making personal appearances over the last few years, but now he's feeling better and coming back. And we got a ton of feedback on Twitter and a lot of people posted either pictures of Dennis or the Midnight Express before Dennis before the Midnight Express uh, and clips and stuff. Cause he, he's done so many cool things anyway. Um, because of that, to bring the drive through customers up to date, because I think there are still some people who every once in a while only listen to one of these programs per week instead of both. So to bring everybody up to date, I wanted to, and, and also it's a, it's a tough story to tell. And I've wanted, didn't want to tell it again from scratch. Uh, so we're going to play the, the, just a few minutes of this past week's experience talking about, uh, Dennis's situation over the past few years, and then we will be back with uh, current programming. Can you can you do that now? Can you can you press the buttons now, Brian? That's going to be the first one, December eighth and ninth, and it will be myself, Bobby Eaton, and Dennis Condry together for the first time in in a little over four years since the Mid South Wrestling Reunion. That was before even your time, Brian. Well, you existed, but not on the show here. Uh, but we had the Mid South Wrestling Reunion WrestleMania weekend 2014, I believe it was, down in in New Orleans. And since then, um, and Bobby and Stan have done a couple things, and I've done a couple things with them. But Dennis has not been a part of it. And this is news to you, also. I'm not trying to ambush you, but I'm I've had information that I was also asked not to impart until the proper time. So I'm telling everybody at the same time, including all the Cult of Cornet members and Brian. Um, the reason why that Dennis has not been at any reunions or made any public appearances is that shortly after that time, he was diagnosed with cancer. Oh my God. And it, it, it started with, as I understand with a tumor on his neck, which necessitated surgery. And then they did treatments. I think it was the radiation thing or whatever the case. And that seemed to work, but it, 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 um, it damaged or they thought it damaged his, his voice because he couldn't get his voice back after those treatments. And they thought it might've just been a burn or whatever the case. I hope I'm saying this right, but he didn't know something's wrong. And they went back in and checked and found that it had spread to, I guess his either esophagus or voice box, that area there. And so the point is since that time he had to have second surgery that removed his voice box I guess it's similar, although it's come a long way since Freebird Buddy Roberts had that type of thing, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. Yeah. But at any rate, um, but now the, the thing is, and it's been after that, uh, you know, obviously ongoing uh, treatments and and trying to uh, get fitted with the right type of apparatuses and et cetera. And you have to work your way up on that thing. But they've come a long way with the artificial you know, voice deals and to where now it doesn't sound, you know, like you've seen in the movies or whatever, the Android type of thing, but no, it sounds like somebody's voice, just it, it, you know, they've come a long way, but obviously there's still limitations and issues with this whole thing. But the good news is that for uh, the past few, he's cancer free and has been for some time. Um, the biggest treatment over the last year, I guess, or so has been the, the changing and fine tuning of the voice deals. Um, but he, he weighs 230 pounds. He feels great. And he wants to get back and, and see us and, and see the fans as, as I'll mention in a second, he didn't even, he didn't know at this point, well, do you think anybody will want to see me? I say, Hey, I, I think they will, but I want to acknowledge the reason why this hasn't been out is Dennis has always been a private guy, right? And with his personal life, <clears throat> and I can't argue with that. And this was a situation where they not only didn't tell the wrestling fans, didn't tell the general public or the news sites or whatever, but actually pretty much their family as well. He and his wife, Teresa, that's the best thing Dennis has ever done, marrying Teresa. And she's been tremendous, but he didn't, he didn't want, he didn't want sympathy or concern or whatever, you know, it's, it was his business. He was concentrating on beating this thing and getting over it, which he has, has pretty much done. 
Um, and that's why you haven't heard a lot about it because, and, and he wasn't in a situation where he needed to, you know, or wanted anybody to think he was asking for help, which is not Dennis Condry's MO either. Um, but at this point, now that he's feeling better and he's got these things under control, the opportunity came just to do this thing in Nashville. And I pitched it to him and, and he said, yes, he wanted to, cause he wanted to see me and Bobby. Uh, but you know, he kind of asked a question. Can't remember what the exact wording was. Do you think they'll, they'll still be interested? And I'll just, I'll just say this. I hope everybody is still interested because for all the people, and of course there's some people who don't like me or, you know, the midnight express is not the greatest tag team of all time, you old man or whatever, but for a large amount of people, especially the fans in the eighties and the fans who are still fans of the eighties and the folks who, remember wrestling from their childhood or who watched it um, on YouTube, you know, when they were kids 20 years after it happened. And for a lot of the wrestlers who have told me, and so I'm not trying to, you know, be like I'm a part of this, but they've said they patterned, they wanted to be a tag team and they patterned themselves in large part after the various versions of the Midnight Express because those teams were cool. And and that's a big compliment. I think all of those people will be interested in in seeing Dennis again. And I think it'd be great if if everybody that possibly can shows him that at these at these various appearances that we're going to do. And it's not going to be across the country. Uh, we basically after Tennessee is is going to be uh, Virginia, West Virginia, and North Carolina. Our you know because none of us are are doing this for our full-time employment anymore and there's logistical issues and and we're all hermits and and don't leave the house a lot anymore but in in our territories that so many people you know enjoyed us in before we're going to do a few of these things and i just hope everybody will come out and let dennis know that he started this whole thing because it, it He was the team captain, as I've said this, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis over the years. He was the team captain when the Midnight Express first became a thing. He named the Midnight Express. He's the guy that Bill Watts talked to in Memphis when, you know, I don't even uh, think he talked to Bobby. And Dennis is the one that told me about three days later, hey, you're coming with us to Louisiana. We're all going to make a fortune. Because he was the veteran and he knew what he was doing. And he had been places. And, and. I think he at that time was viewed as the most successful, obviously next to me since I've been in the business for 14 months, but even Bobby Eaton, who has gone on to, you know, everybody acknowledging how great he was. But at the time, Bobby was the second, you know, he was the flunky with Dennis. Dennis was the top guy of this bunch. And if it hadn't been for being able to ride up and down the road with him, especially because Bobby knew how to do all this shit as a natural. And, and I, he knew this stuff intuitively about office stuff, but Bobby was not a, someone that would sit down and lecture you in the car. Right. But Dennis would tell you, Hey, here's the way this shit works. And here's why. And here's what you got to watch out for. Cause I had no idea what I was fucking doing in a main event spot in one of the biggest territories in the country, uh, you know, at that time. So, you know, it, it, Dennis, got to midnight express started if it if if it had been somebody else in that spot with me and bobby then we might not all be sitting here talking right now so anyway what we're going to do is after the nashville comic con and of course all this is subject to augmentation over the next year but don't expect it to become a habit like i said logistically but uh we're also going to be doing a reunion in west virginia for uh all-star wrestling over there and our good friend Stephen p new will be there uh, in April, uh, with myself and Bobby and Dennis, and then in Richmond, Virginia in May, Stan will be joining us. So you can, and we're going to be doing the photo ops and whole nine yards. And then of course, at the gathering, the Charlotte fan fest, uh, uh volume two that, uh, the f- fine folks at T-Mart promotions are starting up again at the Charlotte Hilton University Place next August, uh, all four of us will be there. And there may be uh, another one or two, but we'll, we'll see what happens. But, you know, anyway, that's uh, that's a deal, and especially the folks in Nashville that can come out because Dennis, Dennis really started, that was his first main event spot, uh, well, besides Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, that was his first main event spot, was in the Tennessee Territory in the mid-'70s with Phil Higgerson. And... I'm sure he has a lot of people that that grew up watching him there also. 
Uh, of course, you've seen me often, but what the heck, I'll come along for the ride anyway. And uh, and he's looking forward to seeing everybody again. And he's communicating with the gimmick. So, you know, sometimes uh, it it, it uh, may take a little bit longer than it used to for him to cuss you out. But uh, it's it's still basically the same flavor. And we're looking forward to seeing everybody. Well, there we hear it, Jim, some audio from the experience you talking about Dennis Condry and what's going on. And I know so many people are already talking about heading to Nashville to see him and, you know, you as well. But to really see him and Bobby Eaton and, and yeah. maybe you. But a uh, question for you. When people go back and look at the Midnight Express, you hear a lot of people talk about, wow, Bobby Eaton did this, Bobby Eaton did that. If you had to look at specific matches where you could say, look at what Dennis did, what matches would those be? What are some of the great Dennis Condry Midnight Express matches that people should watch? Well, actually, all of them. Um, and, and, and here's why. And I mean, especially, of course, let's put it this way. In a 45-degree spot show with uh, Ronnie Garvin and Wahoo McDaniel in an armory, they may not have been the Rock and Roll Express matches in Charlotte, <laughs> right? Right. right. <laughs> um. But the thing, and one of the reasons why I think Dennis gets a bad, not a bad rap, but Dennis doesn't get the lion's share of the attention. Bobby was so spectacular. But here's the thing. Dennis Condry never made mistakes, ne never made noticeable mistakes. He was never in the wrong place for a spot or a finish. He was never off timing. He may have had to stagger around and sell at some points an extra a few seconds waiting on somebody else to be where they were supposed to be. Um, his He was so consistent and his body language. I used to give the guys at OVW and, and Ring of Honor or tell them in seminars, study Dennis Condry's body language. He could convey in a big arena setting anger or fear or shock or frustration uh, with his body as, as, as uh, where you could see it in a, in a big arena setting and his bumps were perfect. His, his shit looked uh, firm and stiff, but didn't hurt. He was light as a feather. That's what Arn Anderson said. The best working heel team that he had ever been in the ring with was Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry. And, and Dennis just, just his timing and his reactions and shit and his style was not like anybody. You can't, Watch uh, on YouTube, watch five matches with Dennis Condry. And I'm not talking about just the TV squash matches, but find the ones out there with the rock and roll in the arenas, the house show matches that fans shot. I sold many of them uh, on the Midnight Express DVD we had on sale quite a while back. Uh, but watch five of those and then tell me anybody else that wrestles the same style and fashion and way and uh, the way of physicality and of taking bumps and everything as Dennis Condry. There's nobody. He was unique. And, and a lot of people forget because Dennis always, he was, he was never a matinee idol, baby face looking fella. And, and with the beard and everything and scars on his head, cause he started, you know, early in Tennessee in the main event. So he had a lot of gig marks they thought he was older than he was, but when he left the Midnight Express in 1987, he was only 35. And he was just, at that point, he was just getting as good, because the guys in the territories in those days, it took 10 or 12 years to really even, you know, even a lot of the, the good talent was still always learning. So you were in your mid-30s when you were as, as good as you were going to get. And, uh, you know, he was still getting better, but his shit was just, it was, it was always right there. So you can't really point. That's the re you can't point to one Dennis Condry match where he was outstanding because he was always good in every match. And he was usually calling the thing, uh, the heels call the match and, and except Bobby calling some of his top rope spots or whatever, Dennis is, is leading the tempo of the thing and telling us when to go home. So it, all those Midnight Express matches were actually kind of, you know, Dennis Condry matches. And then Bobby Eaton was being spectacular and doing his, doing his thing. Well, there you go. A lot of those Mid-South house show matches I always really liked when that footage yes. was out there. Yes. Well, and especially all the Mid-South, yeah, all the Mid-South stuff with the Rock and Roll or with Magnum and, and, and uh, Two or... Fantastics. The Fantastics. And, and I mean, you know, Watson and fucking JYD was interesting to see... Uh, two almost in because Watts had torn his quad in one of the first matches. Is there is his, his no his groin? You couldn't walk with a torn quad, right? 
he 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 tore a groin muscle or something to where he had to have his thigh heavily wrapped and he was pretty much immobile for the rest of the run but these are record houses he's about to gross a million and a half dollars that month so he's not going to fucking miss these matches right but it, and and JYD was that was when he was about ready to go to New York and and it was brutal the effort or lack thereof he gave bill watson the superdome jyd did the coldest tag i've ever seen just because i i don't know what his he was overweight and his personal issues whatever but that was a classic case those matches and a couple of them still exist on on tape of two heels literally flinging themselves into and off of two human beings <laughs> realistically that could not fucking move. Uh, JYD and Watts were both standing. Watts could throw the punch and JYD could headbutt. And Bobby and Dennis are bleeding and flying over the ropes, <laughs> through the ropes. And the people are going insane. And it made Junkyard Dog and Bill Watts completely, uh, barely ambulatory. They looked like they were the toughest two guys in the world. And, you know, so that was a performance I have not seen. And that was, I, that was all of our first big match. Right. So they were going to, they were going to drop the cow. They were going to do everything they could. Where do you put Bill Watts's punches on the list of best punches in wrestling history? Um, in his day, they were pretty darn good. Um, and, and, you know, and, and probably there's probably a reason for that. Luckily he slapped me. He never punched me. He slapped me and, and I saw <laughs> sparkly things for 15 minutes. So I've, Hesitate to think what to put, but they were certainly believable. Let's, let's say that. 